Hallelujah. Amen. I'm going to ask Brother Arlise to come up here. He's going to bring the word of the Lord today. Hallelujah. Amen. Brother Arlise, one of our young up-and-coming preachers. Hallelujah. Amen. Ministers of the word. Brother Arlise, come and bring the word of the Lord. Amen. Brother Arlise, give the Lord a round of applause. Praise the Lord, church. I'm just going to get situated here. I'm glad to be in the house of the Lord this evening. Amen. I believe the lesson has already been passed out, so we'll get straight to the scriptures here. Romans chapter 3, verse 20. I would like to give honor to Pastor Delgado for allowing me to speak to you all tonight. I'd like to give honor to God as well. Romans chapter 3, verse 20. <clears throat> All right. And it reads, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all that believe. For there is no difference for all sin and come short of the glory of God. That's me. That's you. Amen. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God to declare, I say, at this time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded by what law of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. So I'll read that again. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and uncircumcision through faith. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's all say a word of prayer here and ask God to help us today. God, we come before you, Jesus, asking for your divine help, Lord Jesus. God, we need you, Lord, to help us today. Help us understand the scriptures, Lord God, and what it is you're trying to tell the church, Lord. We put full confidence and we rest assured in you, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Louis Pasteur, he um, was the father of the germ theory, and he wanted to cure diphtheria. Uh, him, along with his colleague, Dr. Felix Ra, he was a Jew, uh, Jewish doctor. Felix Ra, uh, his granddaughter died of diphtheria, so he had some emotional ties to trying to find the cure for uh, this diphtheria. And so, if you don't know what the germ theory is, let me just briefly go over it. Germ theory is that it's kind of what, it's common knowledge really now, but the germ theory is that diseases are caused by microorganisms that we can't see with the naked eye, that we have to see under a microscope. And we all know that germs get past, right? And we can't see the germs, and that's the germ theory. And so Louis Pasteur, he was exiled from Paris because of this germ theory. People did not believe in the germ theory. Uh, but him and uh, Dr. Felix Ra, they tried to find a cure for diphtheria. So there was a, a forbidden laboratory where they would do all their research, and they would go out in the forest not too far from, from Paris there, and they started growing diphtheria to tr study it more, to see how it works. And so um, Louis Pasteur, he opens the vault where there's all this diphtheria. There's enough diphtheria in a pail to kill the whole country of France, all right? And so they grab this diphtheria and they swab 20 horses, the eyes, the mouth, and the nose. All 20 of those horses get a fever um, and all but one of those horses die. So there was a real need and there was a real need for a real disease. There needed to be also a real cure. I think that if we look inside of us, every single one of us, we know that there's a real need inside of every single one of us, right? 
It's easy to admit that something is wrong with not just the human race and humanity, but it's easy to admit that something is wrong with us. We seem to always be wrestling and not content. And Pastor was talking about contentment this past Saturday. I think it's a, it's a timely message. Uh, we're just not content. We're always wrestling. We're always trying to get better and do something better. And it's, it's good to try to get better, but godliness with contentment is still a great gain. So we know something is wrong, and we feel that we've fallen short in many areas of our lives. If we've fallen short paying the bills, we may feel that, you know, I, I didn't have enough money to pay the water bill this month. Or if you had enough money, man, I didn't have enough money to save as much as I wanted to save, right? We're always falling short on something. Uh, beauty is fading, and so we're always falling short when it comes to beauty. Isn't that right? We live in a society that wants to be forever 21. Uh, they're constantly looking for the fountain of youth, and they think it can be found through maybe surgical interventions. If they make their body look a certain way, then they're in. They're good. They're, they're made right. They're cured from that. So they're ever working for the perfect body, and you see this when you know, we, we pay... Well, not we, but a lot of people pay any price, really, for a fitness trainer because this fitness trainer is going to help them get their body looking a certain way. They'll pay any monthly fee as long as it guarantees them, guarantees them the result, and they get their cure, to, so to speak. We will, we'll buy these uh, workout videos, and, and I'm a victim, the P90X3, and you know, I haven't bought the Insanity, but when Shanti comes out with a new product, I'm sure people will be flocking to that. So we look to these workout videos to give us a remedy, to give us a cure for our uh, physical blemishes, right? We want to look a certain way, have a certain physique. Um, and, and that's a good thing, to be fit. But we're always falling short. We're never content. There's always something else. There's always something else to climb. Perhaps uh, hair loss could be, a, could be an issue with you, and you turn to Rogaine, hoping, hoping that Rogaine is the, the cure for your hair loss. And if you have a receding hairline, you start really you know, getting paranoid, but don't get paranoid. Be comforted, you know, because you, you really don't lose hair. Hair just migrates. It, it turns wiry, too, to the chest and the, the nose, and just hair migrates, right? So there's hope. Or we may turn to a magic pill, right? Lose 10 pounds in 10 days and maximize your Oreo habit, no problem. We look for that magic pill. A variety of pills for a variety of different problems. Not too long ago, I ran across somebody who, was, who took the, uh, the Femfem diet pill, and I, apparently it was popular in the 90s, and it was off the market now in the 2000s. Uh, a lot of people didn't have any side effects, but a lot of people had very bad side effects. It pretty much put them on a, on a death sentence. We have liver failure, uh, pulmonary hypertension, holes in their heart. It's, it was a mess. It could just, you could have very healthy-looking people. All of a sudden, they, they take the Femfem a pill, the diet pill, and they are pretty much on a death sentence. It's, it's, it was very, very sad. Perhaps it's not a physical beauty that we need a cure for. It may just be something quick, a quick stimulant, legal or illegal. The legal ones, we can just talk about the five-hour energy drink, right, when you got to get stuff done. Gatorade is the thirst quencher. Dr. Pepper is just what the doctor ordered. And if you're hungry, why wait? Grab a Snickers. Snickers satisfies, right? We're always looking for some kind of cure. Now, let's say that uh, Brother Marlon and I, and we'll say Brother James, um, we jump off a boat because the boat is drown it's sinking, and we don't want to drown, so we we're going to go swim to an island. The nearest island is 10 miles away. Let's say that I'll, I'm not... I could, I could swim, like, in a five-foot pool. Then after that, if it's, like, deeper, start getting paranoid and, you know, I sink. Um, so let's say I only go 100 yards. That's still not pretty bad. I don't think I could do that. Let's say I go 100 yards, though, okay? Um, and I sink. And then Marlon, uh, he's, he's pretty fit. So he, he, he goes, and he swims for about five miles, and, you know, he, he, he sinks eventually. But then James, um, he goes for eight miles. And nothing's going to stop him, but let's say it's just a shark comes by and just eats him up or something like that, right? <laughs> so he was, he was going to make it, but just to say something really bad happened, God forbid. Um, so I drown at 100 yards, Brother Marlon drowns at uh, 5 miles, and Brother James drowns at 8 miles. What do we all have in common? We all fall short. We all fall short. Um, in our finances, some may have more money than others, but we still fall short, Right? In happiness, some may be more happy than others, so to speak, 
but we still fall short. In our moral records, in our good deeds, in our good works, in our giving to the poor, in our donations, you know, some may do more than others, but we still fall short of that perfect measure. In your handout, you have Romans chapter 3, verse 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Tonight, I want to talk about four things, mainly. It's on your handout. We need a cure, okay? There is a need. Number one, there's a need for the cure. We're going to talk about what is the cure, who is the cure for, and how do I get it? So number one, the need. What is the cure? Who is the cure for? And how do I get it? So we already covered number one. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is a, there's a true need for a cure. Um, what is the cure? Before we talk about what the cure is, let's talk about what the cure isn't. Uh, the cure isn't our performance. It's not our works. It's not in our ability. Romans chapter 3 verse 20 says, For by works, another fill in there, For by works of the law no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. For by works of the law no man will be justified. Okay. So, put in perspective, I, I had a friend years ago. He was committed to going to church. He was always there early. He was there to help set up, help to break things down. He was an integral part of the youth ministry. He was an usher. He was just very, very faithful. Um, he got a little older. He got a job, and he got laid off from his job. And so some, shortly thereafter, he stops coming to church. We're trying to reach out to him. Hey, what's going on? Where are you at? We don't hear anything. Months later, he opens up to somebody else, and he says, um, the reason I quit going to church was because no matter how hard I tried, it wasn't like I was being compensated, in a sense, or met on the other end by God. Okay? I think we all know people like that, right? That we try, we try, we try, but it seems like God is not kind of meeting us halfway, right? Now, what's wrong with that is that we're not saved by our works, Okay? The cure, the cure is not our works. It's not our performance. It's not our ability. It's not how much I give. And all those things are good. I think when you are saved, as a result of being saved, you do good works. But that doesn't initially save you. So the cure is not our performance. It's not our works. It's not boast and our, our boasting. Um, and, it, it, and religious boasting can hide itself very, very well. And that's one thing we have to be very careful of. We can brag about, I thought, 20 Bible studies this weekend. Teaching Bible studies is good. I, taught a, I myself taught a Bible study this week. I don't think there's anything wrong, obviously, with teaching a Bible study. We need to reach the lost. It's, it's the vision of this church, especially for this month. We're trying to reach the lost. But religious works can hide themselves very good. I feed the homeless. I do this. And those are all good things. But it, that's, our boasting is not what cures us. Our boasting is not what justifies us. Romans chapter um, 3, verse 27. Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. Good works are good. And many times we can boast about our good works, but our boasting, that's not going to save us. I heard someone refer to the uh, uh, professional athletes, and they, they're finding that professional athletes, when they get an injury, they of course, have to go through physical rehab, right, to get their muscles and joints and all that um, back, to, back to main condition. But now, nowadays, they're finding that a lot of athletes, a lot of top-tier athletes, they're having to, to go through a, um, a psychotherapy as well. It's not just physical therapy, but psychotherapy to deal with their depression because they feel like their athleticism, their, their source of boasting, is what justifies them, is what makes them legit, is what validates them in society. Their loss of athleticism makes them lose their reason for being. So what the cure is not, the cure is not in our performance, not in our works, not what we can do, not in our boasting, right? The cure is not that. But justification, justification, that's the next fill-in. Justification is the cure. As we read, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And then the next verse, in verse 24, which is also one of your fill-ins, being justified freely 
by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. We're justified freely. Amen. Now, I've heard many different definitions of uh, justification growing up. Uh, and I'm sure you guys heard some of these too. And if not, we'll go over them. So one of the more common definitions that I'll call the, uh, the classical preacher definition is justification is just as I never did it. How many have heard of that one before? Right? Justification is just as I never did it. Or they may phrase it a little differently. Justification is just as if I have never sinned. And I think there's, there's some truth to that, but it's partial. Uh, justification is just not me or having my sins removed, but it's putting me in a different standing with God. It, I think it's, there's a 50% truth to that. Justification is not only as I never sinned, but it's putting me in a different position in the kingdom of God. Amen? Uh, there's also the more religious definition uh, according to the Christian apologetics and research ministry, they define justification as to be justified is to, declare, to be declared legally righteous. To be justified is to be declared legally righteous. And I think that can work. Uh, but I was kind of thinking, what is justification? How can I kind of put it in more uh, Stocktonian terms, right? So the Stocktonian definition, and if you don't like it, you can scratch it. And just, you know, that, that was just Brother least speaking, whatever. But the Stocktonian definition is justification is you're made legit. You're made legit. Okay? And what do I mean by that? Let's talk about it. Uh, when you go to apply for a job, what do you need? What do you need when you go to apply for a job? If you need a resume, right? A resume shows that you are legit. That you can handle the position, right? It shows that you have the work experience shows that you have the references, that you have the networking, that you know what you're doing, right? You know what you're talking about. Uh, young people, you're going to be applying for university here pretty soon or for college. What do you guys need when you apply for these schools? Your transcript, your GPA, all that, right? That makes you justified in that you're able to handle whatever university you're going into. You're legit. You're not, you're not just you know, just a random person trying to apply for this school, but you're legit and you have a reason to apply. So for jobs, we have our resumes. For school, we have transcripts. I was checking out the uh, football combine uh, results of, or this past week for the NFL, and they have this uh, Byron Jones from Connecticut. He's a cornerback, and he's, he did the standing long, uh, uh, the broad jump, 12 feet and 3 inches. That is huge. It's, it's a big deal when it's 11 feet in the NFL and you have to combine. It's a big feat if you do 11, 11 feet. Or sorry, it's a big deal if you do 11 feet. Um, but just to put it in perspective, the record is, I think, 11 feet 7 inches before that. And that was set by a linebacker back in the 80s from the Buffalo Bills. And Calvin Johnson, how many know Megatron? Right, Calvin Johnson. His, he tied that record with 11 feet 7 inches. Byron Jones beat that record by 12 feet 3 inches so he, he he really beat it what by eight inches or so he beat the record you know 11 feet is big big stuff already that they're talking about now 12 that's just that's unheard of so what's the byron jones saying he's saying i'm legit i can i can play in the nfl i have the athleticism i qualify i am justified right Romans chapter 4, verse 3, for what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. How are we made legit? It's not by our resume. It's not by our transcripts. It's not by our athleticism. But we believe God, and it's accounted to us for righteousness. Amen? Do I have any believers here at Lighthouse of the Valley? We believe God can do the impossible. We, can, we believe God can do miracles. We believe we're justified. We believe that God has a cure, that we don't have to turn to other sources for the answer. We believe in God, amen, and it's accounted to us for righteousness. So how does this, how does this work? How does justification work? Romans 3 verse 28 says, For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Dr. Jack Fish um, He's a professor, I believe, at one of the seminaries. He's, he says justification is both a positive, and that's on your fill-in. Justification is a positive and a negative. The negative is, blessed is he who sent, whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is he unto, unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. 
The negative is my sins are removed. That's the negative of justification. The positive is I have favor with God. I have a right standing with God. It's, it's a whole different life. It's not just that my sins are removed. I'm, you know, I'm still the same person because I don't have the ability to become a different person. But justification is my, oh, my past is removed and I have a new life and I have the ability I mean, to expand upon that new life because Christ has given me the power and the strength. Justification is a positive and a negative. Don't just look at it as, oh, my sins are forgiven and that's it. No, there's a, there's a whole new life to live. Amen. Uh, Romans chapter 4 verse 25 states that Jesus was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Uh, Dr. David Bernard, the superintendent of the EPC, he writes in his book, Holy Spirit, and, or Justification and the Holy Spirit. He links justification with the resurrection of Christ. And that's also a fill-in with the resurrection. There's a link between justification and the resurrection. I find it interesting, and I've, I've been studying Romans quite a bit lately um, if you look at Romans chapters 1 through about 4 talks about repentance and being justified inside of God chapter 6 starts talking about baptism and identifying yourself with Christ and his baptism chapter 7 and 8 talk about living the spirit-filled life that really echoes the Acts 2 38 message repent be baptized receive the Holy Ghost it's not exempt from anywhere else in the Bible but there's big long expositions of what that really is when you're living a repented justified life read romans chapter one through four really you can add five to it as well if you want to read more about the baptism the remission of sins we're buried with him by baptism into death romans chapter six about receiving the holy ghost and living that spirit-filled life romans chapter seven and eight it's the first eight chapters of romans is really a an elongated acts 2 38 message amen so justification is linked with the resurrection of Christ. Um, those who are justified by Christ, by Christ, then they also receive the Spirit to indwell their lives. There's no reason why if you're justified by Christ and, and you, be, you believe in God to forgive you of your sins, there's no reason why you can't get the Holy Ghost. Everyone can get the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is for all. Abraham, um, if you study the life of Abraham... Abraham, in Genesis chapter 15, he believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. In Genesis chapter 17, there is the whole circumcision process that takes place, okay? Abraham believes God in Genesis 15. The reality is he's justified and he's accounted righteous. That's the reality. In Genesis 17, there's a circumcision that starts taking place, and that it serves as a symbol to Abraham's justification in his covenant with God. Genesis 15 comes before Genesis chapter 17. Abraham was made righteous. Then Abraham goes through the circumcision, and there is a symbol of his righteous life. Okay? Um, take that into consideration now that when we are justified and when we repent of our sins, there's a symbol that comes with that as well, and that's baptism. And that's what Romans chapter 6 talks about. It's a symbol of our justification. Now, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we announced about the... Um, the vaccinations um, and it, whenever you get vaccinated you get the actual vaccine but what do you also get you get a little record and they stamp it right to show it's, it's, it's legit that you really got the vaccine on such and such day they're not going to give you that stamp or they shouldn't give you that stamp if you actually haven't got vaccinated right i kind of liken it that way we are justified with christ you still need to get that stamp to show, you know, it's a public confession. Baptism is a public confession that you're justified by Christ, that you're identifying yourself with him. You still got to get that thing stamped and prove that you actually got your vaccines. I couldn't go back to work without the, uh, without the influenza vaccine. We had to get a little green sticker on our badge to show that we got the vaccine. If we didn't get the vaccine, we could just wear a mask. But that green sticker, they wouldn't give to me without the vaccine, Right? I had to get the vaccine first, and they would give me that sicker. The sicker was symbolic of me getting the vaccine. Baptism is symbolic of us being justified with Christ. If you're justified with Christ, there's no reason you should shun baptism. There's no reason you should try to divert away from baptism. Baptism is an awesome experience, amen. It's a confession that I've, I'm saved, and, and I just thank God for removing, for removing those sins, amen. So baptism is that public or is that public stamp or seal? It's also a fill-in. Baptism is that public stamp. 
So who is it for? Who is justification for? Uh, Romans chapter 3, verse 29. Or is God the God of the Jews only? Is he not the God of the Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also. So since God is one who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Amen. Who is it for? The gospel message is transcultural. And what I mean by transcultural, it can go work in any cultural. Why? Because truth by nature is transcultural. Two plus two in the U.S. equals four, right? Does two plus two equal, equal four in Mexico? Right? Dos, you know, I'll keep on doing it that way. Two plus two equal four in Australia, in Borneo? Right? In any country in Asia, does two plus two equal four? Yeah? Why, why is that so? Because truth is transcultural. Truth can work in all places, Right? If, something, if, if it's something that's culturally re- relative, then it, then it won't work. But this gospel message is a transcultural message, amen? The cure, the cure that I'm talking about is effective for all people, and it's in your filling there, for all people in all places and at all times. It's transcultural. The gospel is effective for all people in all places at all times. And if, if you look at the, the Gospels, really, the, the, the Gospel narrators, they make a really good case about this. Um, they show how miracles happen on Jewish soil. They show how miracles happen on Gentile soil. God is not a biased God. Amen. The, the, the Gospel message is transcultural, and it'll work wherever. The Bible says the Gospel message is the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first and also to the Greek. I thank God for a transcultural gospel that is just not limited to the Hispanic race or to the Caucasian race, African American race. Amen. It's a transcultural gospel. Praise God. I'm glad it works for everyone and for all people in all places at all times. We're going to look into the account of the eunuch in Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8 verse 26. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. Acts chapter 8, verse 27. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Queen Candace of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all treasure, and had come to Jerusalem for to worship. Now, in Acts chapter 8, there is, there's Philip. He's an evangelist, and he's preaching to an Ethiopian eunuch. Okay? Philip must have been alarmed. If, if, if he was familiar with the Old Testament scriptures... Philip would have been alarmed that this is just a very different occasion. Why is that so? In Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 1, the eunuch is excluded from the congregation of the Lord. This man is an Ethiopian eunuch. He's excluded from the congregation of the Lord. Isaiah chapter, um, well, before, yeah, Isaiah chapter 39, verse 7, it mentions that Hezekiah's royal bloodline, they're going to be taken captive, and they're going to be made eunuchs. Uh, being made a eunuch was uh, associated with paganism, okay? And here we have a eunuch was, which could have been taken as being associated with paganism, something other than Judaism, and here Philip is confront, confronting him about the gospel. If you look at Isaiah chapter 56, verses 1 through 8, it welcomes the foreigner and it welcomes the eunuch. So there's a prophecy that one day the eunuch, that person who has been outcasted and excommunicated from the house of the Lord, um, and the foreigner, the outsider, they're going to be welcome into the community of believers because the cure is for everyone. Isaiah chapter 56, verse 1, Thus says the Lord, keep justice and do righteousness, for soon my salvation will come and my deliverance be revealed. Verse 3, Let not the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say, The Lord will surely separate me from his people. And let not the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. Okay, if you look at the eunuch and his life, he did have that, you know, if you look at dry tree, dry tree really is talking about a sterile male, but he had a very, very hopeless situation in a culture that was, that stressed offspring and fertility. The eunuch had a very hopeless situation. And here in Isaiah, there's, there's promise to that, to that hopeless individual. Let not the eunuch say, behold, I'm a dry tree. And we'll keep reading here to figure out how this plays out. Uh, Acts chapter 8, verse 28. 
Um, he was running and sitting in his chariot and read Isaiah the prophet. Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip, Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understand us what thou readest. And he said, How can I accept some man should guide me? And he desired, he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. The place of the scripture which he read was this. He was, he was led as a sheep to the slaughter and a, like a lamb dumb before her shears. So he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. Who shall declare his generation for his life is taken from the earth? And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee of whom, thou, of whom speaketh the prophet, this of himself or some other man. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. For, you know, the common, I guess, Christian that's oriented to Testament scriptures, they would look at Isaiah chapter 53, and they would know that it's Jesus. But the Jews didn't believe that it's Jesus. Uh, don't believe that it's Jesus, obviously. Uh, they did believe that it was the Messiah. But about the 12th and, uh, 11th and 12th century, uh, by, by the name of Rashi, he came along and he said that this no longer means that it's the Messiah. It's the nation of Israel. So now that's, that's why the Jews believe that. I don't have time to go into the different flaws of, with that situation. But that's why the nation of Israel does not believe that Isaiah 53 to the Messiah. But going back to the in verse 36. Test, test. Praise God. Thank you. Okay. Um, Acts chapter 8, verse 36. And as they went on their way, they came into a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. The eunuch, he was a foreigner, and I should say the, the, the individual in Acts chapter 8 was both a foreigner and a eunuch, and that's in your handouts there, who had been prohibited entry by the law. He was a eunuch and a foreigner, and he, he had been prohibited from coming into the, the, the congregation of God. What the gospel does, it tears down social, ethnic walls. It tears down walls of division. When I look at the church, the church is the place where I meet people that are, are most unlike me, but most like me. What I mean by that is the church is where I, I congregate with people that, you know, we, we come from different backgrounds, different cultures. We may speak different languages, and they're very unlike me in that regard, but they're most like me in the regard that mission, the mission to life, amen, the mission to life, what are we here for? I mean, we're all justified by the blood of Christ. It, it, we're all one body. And so the church is where I, I, I congregate with people that are most unlike me, but like me at the same time. And here we see that the gospel message is inviting, and our ministries must also be inviting as well. Praise God. Amen. This, theme's, uh, this month's theme is reaching the lost. Reaching the lost. And when I was reading the story of the eunuch uh, in Acts chapter 8, it's, it, it goes along with that theme that we are, we're reaching the lost, and the cure is for everyone. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't exempt you. I know a lot of cures, if you have such a condition and this condition, you can't try this medication, Right? There's, there's all these things that they rule out before. And, but the gospel doesn't work that way because the gospel is a cure for everyone. And if you look at the hopeless situation that the eunuch had, and Isaiah 56 verse 3 says that he instructs, instructs the eunuch rather to not let him say, Behold, I am a dry tree. Don't let the eunuch say he's a dry tree. Why? Because he's no longer going to be a dry tree. But uh, as a matter of fact, he's actually going to be perhaps the father to, of the gospel to the people in Ethiopia right? A, a, a foreigner and a eunuch, a totally, a total other, an outcast. And Jesus is always inviting the outcast, the poor, the widow, the immigrants, the Old Testament talks about. Every one of us, too, we have our own set of dry t tree situations. We have our own set of hopeless situations. But the gospel is a cure for that, amen? It's justification. It's the, it's the cure for our dry tree situations. So how, how do we get, how do we get it? Number four, how to get the cure? We have to recognize that it's not by works. It's not by something that we do. Romans 3, 28, 28. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. How do we get it? We have to acknowledge that it's a free gift. Another fill in there. We have to acknowledge that it's a free gift. Who are more apt to accept free gifts? 
when I, when I consider society, I think that poor people are more apt to consider free gifts. The Bible says that, you know, uh, unless you become like children, you're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. Because we're so used to working, working, working all our lives. And if we don't have any input in us attaining something, then we don't want it. Oh, if I can't work for it, I don't want it, right? I'm, I'm guilty of that. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. So we have to acknowledge that it's a free gift. But in order to do that, we have to humble ourselves, therefore, in the sight of God. It's not going to be by anything that we do, by anything that we work out. But we have to humble ourselves in the sight of God. Uh, when we get the, free, the cure, we have to stamp it through baptism. That's another fill in there. Stamp it through baptism. You can read Romans chapter 6 to find out more about that. And we experience it through the Holy Ghost or through the Holy Spirit. We experience this justification as we live a concrete lives in the Holy Ghost. Amen. Brother Ian, if you can come and play. Amen. Remember how we talked about diphtheria and the disease uh, that was going on in France? Remember Dr. Rose's granddaughter, how she died of the black diphtheria? You guys remember that together with Louis Pasteur, um, the father of the germ theory, that they try to find a cure? Do you guys remember how Louis Pasteur was exiled from Paris because of the germ theory? You guys remember how they were relentless, the Jewish doctor and Louis Pasteur, they were relentless in trying to find a cure? Do you guys remember how his colleague, Dr. Ruch, inoculated 23 or 20 horses with diphtheria? And do you guys remember how all the horses but one died? They said for several more days, this final horse lingered, lying pathetically on the ground, while Ruh, Pasteur, and several others were sleeping on cots in the stables. And the orderly on duty had been instructed to awaken the scientists should there be any change in the animal's temperature during the night. And at 2 o'clock in the morning, the temperature showed a half-degree decrease in the, on that one horse that was alive. And so the orderly, he awakened Dr. Ru and informed him of this. Uh, come morning time, uh, a couple hours later, the temperature decreased by two degrees. And by nighttime, the fever was entirely gone, and the horse was able to stand, eat, and drink. So Dr. Ru is really excited here. He's on the verge of some kind of scientific breakthrough, right? And so he takes a, he takes a sledgehammer, and he strikes this beautiful horse between the eyes, gives it a death blow between the eyes, and he draws all the blood from the veins of this animal that had de developed the black diphtheria but had overcome it. The scientists drove as fast as they could to the municipal, municipal hospital in Paris, and they forced their way past all the guards, and they went into this room where 300 babies lied with diphtheria. They inoculated all 300 babies and all but 300 survived all but three lived and recovered completely why because they were saved by the blood of an overcomer the last scripture on your lesson here romans chapter 5 verse 9 much more than being now justified by his blood we shall be saved from wrath through him amen the cure what is the cure i should say the need for the cure we know there's a need for a cure there's always something wrong amen how do we get the cure? The cure is found in our justification with Christ. We symbolize it through baptism. We live it out with the Holy Ghost. Amen. That's how we get the cure. We, we come humbly before the throne of God. As we all stand.